For Hype Plus News, I'm Nichelle Woods. Black people in America have long worked to lessen the gap between whites when it comes to building wealth. Slavery, redlining, and even the family dynamic within the home have all played a role in making the task more difficult to complete. Government assistance was created in the 1930s to solve a temporary issue. However, society showed that these benefits could be necessary long term. As time has gone on, government assistance became a mainstay in many Black households to help make ends meet. With many of the Black homes receiving government assistance being headed by single Black women, questions come into play about just how beneficial this would be for Black people. There's no denying that Black people live in poverty at higher rates than whites, and that government assistance does help with food, rent, and other necessities each month. On the other side of the spectrum lies the issue of broken homes and the poverty that comes from receiving government assistance, ironically enough. Considering both sides, the million-dollar question becomes, did government assistance ruin the Black family? Like many things, government assistance was given sparingly, if at all, to Black families in the early 1900s. In 1935, following the Great Depression, President Franklin D. Roosevelt established the Social Security Act of 1935 with intentions of assisting the elderly, dependent children, and those who had lost their jobs as a result of the Depression. Despite the fact that Black families were clearly more impoverished overall, the assistance given out overwhelmingly went to white families. Information taken from the child support hustle revealed that, with the New Deal, state legislators began to pass bills that supported single mothers called Mother's Pension. Since the states operated these programs, administrators were not regulated by federal government. The lack of governing of the Mother's Pension program meant that states could deny services and money to qualifying Black mothers. This aspect of the law caused great issues as it would set the precedent for caseworkers and states to set forth even more provisions in order to keep Black families from receiving government assistance or giving up something of equal value in order to receive such help. While the practice was illegal, with no penalty for continuing it, the tactic became more common, allowing caseworkers to essentially control people's lives. Rules regarding a suitable home were enacted without giving Black people a clear idea of what that would entail. In the South specifically, Blacks saw great pushback when it came to receiving government assistance, with states posing stipulations that discouraged a complete Black family. Alabama is one state that stands out as the state independently submitted a plan in 1964 about a substitute parent rule that would effectively harm Black families specifically. Aspects of the proposal stated that a child would have a substitute father, hereby disqualifying their home from receiving government assistance if a substitute father lives in the home with the child's mother for the purpose of cohabitation, if he frequently visits to cohabitate with the mother, or if he does not frequent the home but cohabitates with the child's natural or adoptive mother elsewhere. These facts are telling as they show a direct attack on the Black man by giving an ultimatum of them being in the home, even for a short period of time versus receiving help. With the Black marriage rate lowering from the 1960s on, cohabitating was common throughout the country. While again, there could seem to be benefits in this way, Statistics have proven that the creation of these single-parent homes through the type of legislation has a lasting impact. These new laws, beginning in 1964 from Alabama and other states, paralleled the passing of the Great Society laws passed in the same year that saw government assistance change, possibly for the worse. The Institute of Family Studies sheds light on this fact, stating, it was estimated that in 1975, a household head would have to earn $20,000 a year to have more resources than what could be obtained from Great Society programs. In today's dollars, that's over $90,000 per year in earnings. That may be a reason why, in 1964, only 7% of American children were born out of wedlock compared to 40% today. One can see through this tactic that the government purposefully incentivized these women to have more children out of wedlock as the type of money being offered, even in more modern times, is hard to come by as a salary for anyone, much less a Black man or a woman. In the early to mid-1990s, Black households saw a peak when it came to fatherless homes as nearly 70% of Black families saw this as their reality. This number had remained relatively unmoved for decades before dropping back down and there are still government programs and benefits that people know they could be in danger of losing due to other people. There have even been several Black women refusing to get married in fear of losing their benefits as they will receive more money personally from the government than they could from a job by not having the man present. 
On the other side of the spectrum, however, statistically, these homes still end up with children living in poverty, as marriage, according to the IFS studies over time, will position these families to have more money and be able to survive long term as the two incomes, even with the women's lowering, over time will position these families to maintain. These women choosing not to marry was not a simple choice, but more so a government tactic forcing them to choose between money and family. Another major change that may or may not have played a role in damaging the Black family was the transparency needed from government assistance recipients as time went on. Welfare and other assistance would be given to those that showed need, giving the government access to bank account information and essentially one's entire life to determine eligibility. For the Black family, this would lead to a surge in improper spending and the trading of benefits for another. Selling of one's food stamps became popular in the 1980s and beyond, whether it be for cash or another benefit. With some families already receiving cash assistance on top of other benefits, the existence of these programs led some to try and find new ways to qualify in order to receive more money. While it is much more difficult today to have one government assistance program provide more money than one can make in a year, it is still very possible to combine programs to be able to provide everything a person would need. Possibly the biggest factor to consider when it comes to government government assistance is how it spiked the rate of child support cases in the Black family. Once many of these women had gotten a man out of the house to receive their benefits, they realized quickly that this money, depending on how many children are present, would not be enough to sustain a home. Lawyers in the 1990s would even work pro bono on a case dealing with child support, giving these women more confidence in taking the father of their children to court and receiving more money. Courts notoriously gave men payments to make that were outlandish with penalties that would make it impossible for them to get the money needed. This action, unsurprisingly, would lead to an uptick in crimes committed by many Black men of the time. In a published paper by Harvard alum Fritz Foley, one can see the correlation between crime and welfare payments as the text reads. Analysis of daily reported incidents of major crimes in 12 U.S. cities reveals an increase in crime over the course of monthly welfare payment cycles. The jump reflects increases in crime that are likely to have a direct financial motivation like burglary, larceny, theft, motor vehicle theft, and robbery. Taking into account the countless issues that come from having a record when it comes to making money on top of systemic racism, especially in years past, one can see clearly how this assistance ruined the lives of many Black fathers and children at the very least, as their fathers would spend years in jail, and with the overwhelmingness of being a single parent, the children suffer as well in ways unimaginable. There can be debate about the reasoning behind certain decisions Black families made, however, the need for more assistance Distance is clear. Families selling stamps for cash, fathers being kicked out of the homes, and caseworkers who acted as an extension of the government while breaking the law all played a role on how government assistance would affect Black people. The need for assistance is obvious, especially in the present as a recession looms over society. Nevertheless, it is clear that there are major issues with government assistance that have plagued Black families for decades. If assistance is given to elevate a person in order to help them become more independent, one should ask themselves if this seems like the case when it comes to Black people. With a history of struggle and suffering despite this help, it may not be a foregone conclusion that assistance ruined the Black family, but many can argue it did little to help as Black families today see nearly half of their homes without a father and are still financially trying to catch up in society. Stay up to date with the latest news in comedy, music, and sports by subscribing here to our YouTube channel. Follow Hype Plus across all social media and look out for original content on our new streaming service. For Hype Plus, I'm Nichelle Woods.